So moving on from um, these synthetic statistical methods to more advanced methods, so-called deterministic statistical methods, uh, we're going to start thinking about incorporating GCM data at daily time scales using multiple variables, more than just um, monthly temperature and precipitation. And we're also hoping to get past some of the limitations of an interpolation-based approach. So methods that can start to capture regional climate and weather patterns. And so these are moving more and more towards what dynamical downscaling um, could do, but they are statistical in nature. And so a method that uh, I've been working on with colleagues recently is called the Multivariate Adaptive Constructed Analogs, or MACA method. And this method is advantageous in that it directly incorporates synoptic meteorology from GCMs. And it basically goes back to this point of isn't just climate made up of thousands of little weathers. And so the premise here is that um, if you can downscale and process weather day by day, and you do that long enough, you're going to get climate. And if you process climate long enough, you're going to get downscaled climate change. So it's really kind of getting more to the core of, of climate change uh, rather than imposing monthly climate data. So the procedure here for the MACA method is a little bit um, a little bit detailed, but I'll go through a few of the steps here. And the first step we've actually dealt with when we talked about the BCSD. So basically we have our GCM synoptic daily weather fields. We can bias correct those so that they actually adhere to our observational data set. The second uh, step here is to adaptively account for disappearing or novel analogs. And this is an important feature. One of the problems with uh, so-called analog methods in a climate change scenario is that you can imagine as we go out f uh, further in time, we may be in a period where we have no analogs. And so we have to account for this in our methodology. The third, met the third step here is kind of the meat and potatoes of the MACA method, and that's really the constructed analog search, which I'll get into in some more detail. And then finally, a post-process bias correction. And I will point out here that um, uh, the general procedure here for the MACA method uh, follows very closely with uh, the bias corrected constructed analogs method of, of Ed Maurer at Santa Clara University. So um, a couple points here about disappearing or novel analogs. And so here we're looking at a cumulative distribution function of temperature for uh, a grid cell here located across uh, eastern Washington state. Um, and we can see here two different time periods. These are daily maximum temperatures for the month of August. So 20th century GCM conditions are shown here in blue and the late 21st century run from the A1B scenario is shown here in red. And what you clearly see is that there's about 20% of the data um, for which basically temperatures are warmer than they were even the warmest temperature for the 20th century. So we consider here in this period there's no appropriate analog. And that's going to be a problem when we're actually looking for analogs um, and analog pattern matching. And so we really address this problem using a very simple epoch adjustment whereby we remove the difference field um, prior to our constructed analogs search. And so this is basically an even shift across the cumulative distribution function. So after we remove um, the differences, we can see that basically most of our distribution here um, for our 21st century run falls within the 20th century um, distribution. So that's important when we're, again, when we're looking out for analog searches in the future. A point here to make is that these differences are removed for the analog search and then they're reintroduced after the final step. The same thing holds for precipitation. So there may be no appropriate analogs for future heavy precipitation events. And so here we're looking at the same thing. Uh, GFDL model, and I think this is actually looking at uh, 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 daily precipitation for the month of January. So we can see some significant increases in the heavy precipitation events. Uh, those are again are adjusted and basically what happens is that we can preserve uh, some of the raw features of the GCM. And so in this case here we're seeing that the GCMs are basically showing a, a 10 to 15 percent increase in the magnitude of these 
uh, the 95th and 99th percentile precipitation events. And the downscaled output will preserve these differences across the cumulative distribution. So the beaten potatoes of the constructed analogs method, the concept here is that um, we're really looking at a weather typing based approach. And this is based off matching spatial patterns. Um, and the idea here is that we're adding additional value over basically an interpolation based approach. Uh, there are different ways to go about analog searching. You can look for an identical analog. The problem with that is you might be waiting a while. Uh, you can go with a single best pattern match. And, and I should mention here that these pattern matching, the pattern matching is basically done by finding, um, by using root mean square error to your target field. Um, and then this approach that we have used and basically are adopting from um, Hugo Hidalgo's work is a constructed analog approach, which uses many sampling opportunities uh, to resolve our future downscaled field. And the idea behind analog searches is that DCMs are giving us uh, synoptic uh, type patterns in temperature and precipitation, winds, etc. We know that the mesoscale features, basically what we're trying to resolve with downscaling, um, those are going to be sensitive to the larger scale patterns. So basically the larger scale is going to be setting the stage for the subsynoptic or mesoscale features that we hope to resolve. So let's go through an example here of, of how an analog is constructed. So we're given a, um, a target field here, and we're looking here in an example from a GCM of a May 14th, 2048, okay? So we have this spatial field here. When looking for constructed analogs, we basically can go back to our historic library of synoptic scale fields, and we restrict this as being about um, using a window f uh, plus or minus 45 days from the given target. So our given target here is May 14th, plus or minus 45 days from that. Over all years, we have this extensive library. We can go through this library and identify the top 30 days that best match this pattern of our, our target field. And when we do that, we find our 30 best analogs, um, and we can basically develop um, a, a coefficients for these uh, patterns that we found and form this linear construct of analogs. And so here's our, uh, our coarse scale constructed analog and you can see it resembles to a fairly good degree our target field. The difference here is that these constructed analogs are made up directly from our historic library. And so if we can actually do this for our coarse scale fields, we can do the same thing because along with these core scale analogs, we have our fine scale observations. And so we can apply those same coefficients, and what we end up developing here is a constructed downscaled um, analog. Now, your analog search can be done variable by variable, um, but what we end up finding is that to really improve the coherence across variables, kind of getting more first at the first order principles of meteorology, um, it's better to actually perform, perform a joint analog search. So basically doing an analog search where you look at jointly the synoptic uh, patterns of Tmax, Tmin, specific community. And we found that when we combined those three together, we were able to actually get at much, much, uh, uh, do a much better job at resolving uh, high temperature, low temperature, high relative humidity, and low relative humidity. Uh, we did likewise for the meridional and zonal winds. So those were coupled together and we got out wind velocity, so a directional and a speed component. And then finally precipitation. Um, we looked just at precipitation, looked at the coarse scale of precipitation to resolve the fine scale of precipitation. There may be a better way to basically couple precipitation and wind speeds to basically have a, an improved uh, downscale field, but we stopped at this point. So it's always important um, for users to be cognizant of how well your downscaling method can work. Now there are problems with that because we would like to be able to validate downscaled uh, climate data sets with future climate data, but again, we'd be waiting a very, very long time. So the strategy here is that we used um, uh, the ECM WF interim reanalysis as a surrogate GCM. So 
this reanalysis acts very much like a GCM, except that it's actually incorporating daily uh, data from radio zones, uh, etc., into its uh, analyzed large scale, core scale fields. We then performed a cross validation looking at about 20 years of data, downscaled the ECMWF reanalysis, and then compared uh, our downscaled fields from MACA as well as a daily BCSD to an interpolation based approach. And the interpolation based approach is very, very simple. Basically, it's just taking in the uh, ECMWF reanalysis and interpolating it directly to uh, the resolution of our downscale data. So some of the validation statistics here, this is just looking at the correlation coefficient, and we split this up in looking to, into look at two different time periods. So one being the cool season, November through April, one being the warm season, May through October, for in this case, just Tmax, uh, the minimum relative humidity, and then daily precipitation amount. And so what we see here for the interpolation based approach, uh, things it does a pretty good job for temperature and that's not a surprise. There's a really strong coupling between surface temperature and the lower atmospheric temperature. I will point out that you can see some significant differences here in even an interpolation based approach in areas of complex topography. So clearly here we can see the Central Valley of California, lower correlation coefficients, uh, also similar things in the Snake River Plain area. And we know that in winter uh, there's often times when valley high temperatures can be decoupled from uh, temperatures aloft due to inversions. And although along the coast you can still see problems, again there's a lot of decoupling going on between uh, the marine boundary environment and what's happening inland. And the GCMs it's, they're themselves are not going to resolve that. Some of the some of the improvements of the MACA method is that it does not rely on an interpolation based approach and it instead uses the historical library of patterns. By actually incorporating uh, the macro scale information on those days and implementing the fine scale features, you're able to actually get uh, see dramatic improvements in your temperature on those days. Uh, relative humidity, dramatic improvements in the MACA method. Again, the, 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 the gist behind this is that the MACA method is really incorporating both uh, temperature and specific humidity in its uh, joint analog search. And so we see um, correlation coefficients here in summer, and summer is pretty important for humidity in terms of resolving fire danger, we see correlation coefficients by and large uh, greater than 0.85 across much of the interior west. For precipitation, we can see that the interpolation based approach, that you do a pretty good job here in wintertime um, west of the Cascades and Sierra, and you drop off significantly in the lee of that and as you move further east. Um, the BCSD method, there's some slight improvements, but by and large, similar similar patterns. Um, the MACA method, you see pretty pretty dramatic improvements here, particularly on the lee side of the topography. And again, this is getting um, this is basically going between these interpolation-based approaches to uh, analog search. We can see very quickly here, looking at summer precipitation or the warm season precipitation, reanalysis does a much, much poorer job here in the monsoonal area. Um, and this is an important thing to point out here. Um, if the reanalysis is unable to actually resolve uh, macro scale precipitation in an area, downscaling methods are not going to do uh, not going to do justice. And that's an important thing for us to think about when we go through selecting GCMs for downscaling. Can the GCM actually simulate temperature precipitation, whether, whatever variables you're looking for? And in this case, these poor correlations here in the monsoonal area, even with the MACA approach, you still actually see poor correlations. And very briefly here, we can look at um, how the MACA method does compared to the daily BCSD when looking at um, something called the energy release component. And the energy release component is basically uh, a metric used by fire management to gauge fire danger. And it integrates uh, temperature, precipitation, relative humidity, and insulation. And so instead of looking at a single variable, this is really looking at the integral of meteorology integrated over time. 
and it's probably a better way to actually gauge how a method works for a given application. And so we can see here observations shown here in black, and we can see that the BCSD and the MOCA method are very, very close in actually capturing uh, the magnitude